That's good. I may just speak to you from into from Scripture. It's called the Word of Life. There are a lot of names for the Bible. That's one I like. One of the many I like. The Word of Life. Turn to Matthew chapter 15 with me tonight, please. Verse 21. Matthew chapter number 15, verse 21. The book of Matthew has, um, over and over again, it has illustrations and parables, stories to tell you about the life of the Lord, things that He did. Some of them just jump out at you. This is one of them. In verse 21 it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan. So now we've set the scene. This is not an Israeli. She is not a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a Canaanite woman. And the Bible says that she came out of the same coast, cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her, Not a word. Let that settle in for a moment. Not a word. He did not even acknowledge her presence. Not a word. And the Bible said, And his disciples came besought him, saying, Send her away. Let that settle in now. Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Let that settle in for a moment. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Let that settle in for a moment. Selah. Think on that. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Think on that. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, Father... It's your blessed word, Lord. I'm simply the vessel here tonight. Minister this blessed book, Father, to my heart and to the hearts of everybody who hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. First of all, I want you to look at this text dispensationally. This is one of the reasons of many that I'm a dispensationalist. What's that, preacher? I believe that certain things in the Bible fit in certain time periods. They belong in certain time periods. They have to. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ just got through telling this woman, I have nothing to do with you. Now, what if I got up in the pulpit and preached that to you? That if you're a Syrophoenician, you're a Canaanite, you're a Greek. Mark chapter number 7 is the parallel verse to this, Mark 7. And it says just a couple of things, just a little bit different, uh, well, not differently, but a little, it gives a perspective on some other things relating to the same event. Well, what if I got up and told you, well, you know, he only came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Look over here in Matthew chapter number 10. Matthew 10. We are compelled to rightly divide the word of truth. Verse 1, Matthew 10, verse 1. When he had called to him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And in what follows the twelve, if you look at verse 4, Judas Iscariot is always listed last. But look at verse number 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, now look at this, go not into the way of the, of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 7, 
and preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, do you see why we are driven to rightly divide the word of truth? Well, is this wrong, preacher? No, there's nothing wrong about it. But this is early in the ministry of Christ when he was the Jewish Messiah offering the kingdom of heaven to the Jews. And in Matthew, if you read through the book, you'll find when you get over, I think about the fifth chapter, six, somewhere in there, you'll get to the Sermon on the Mount. And you'll get to the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of those teachings relate strictly to the kingdom of heaven, to the Jewish people and their Messiah. Was the Lord Jesus Christ the Jewish Messiah? Absolutely. Is he the Jewish Messiah? Absolutely. Will he come as the Jewish Messiah? Absolutely. But he's more than that. Far more than simply a ruler or a leader of the Jewish people. The word Mashiach is the Hebrew word. Christos is the Greek word. And they both mean anointed. When we say Christ, we're saying the anointed one, the anointed of God. His name is Jesus. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. When you call him Lord, you are saying he is the master of the universe. He is the owner of all. And it's quite a remarkable thing. You get the book of Revelation when it begins to exalt the Lamb of God that's before the throne. That he's not exalted so much as the Christ, but he's exalted as Lord. And the reason he's exalted as Lord is because the book of Revelation has to do with God's ownership of the earth. Because he's coming to take what rightfully belongs to him. And he asks no questions. He takes it by force. So the first time he came, he came as the lowly lamb of God that died in weakness on the cross, laying his life down so that we could be saved. But when he comes the next time, he will come as a man of war, riding on a white stallion as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But in between those two comings, the first coming and the second coming, a lot transpires as it relates to the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is nowhere to be found in Matthew chapter 15. Nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Because the body of Christ is made up of both Jew and Gentiles. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Ephesians that he might make of twain two one new man. In the sight of God, when it comes to the bride of Christ, there is no such thing as a messianic or a Gentile church. There's just one church made up of Jew and Gentile that make up that one body. But when you rightly divide the scriptures, you have to say to yourself, what's going on here then? If he turned this woman away, and he did, he said, I've only come to the lost sheep. You have no claim on me. Because here's what she said. She said, Jesus, thou son of David. If you read Matthew chapter number one, you'll find that the son of David is the Messiah. He's the Mashiach. So she was saying to him, Jesus, the Messiah. He didn't answer her. Why not? Because she's a Gentile. And she has no claims on him as the Messiah. What he has for the Gentiles rises above Messiah. What he has for the Gentiles is what Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So I am compelled to rightly divide the word of truth and place this in its right setting, in its right time. And this helps a great deal in understanding so many things that are said in Matthew. It took the Pauline revelation of the Apostle Paul to take what Christ did when he was here 2,000 years ago and open it up for us to understand. Sure, the church was in his mind. He said, I will build this church but the church that he t was talking about to Peter and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Thaddeus and the rest of them, they had no concept of that body that we just take for granted today. 
Now let's look at the second thing that's going on here. Once we understand it dispensationally, let's look at it practically. I want you to notice what this woman does. Look carefully at it. The Bible says that she came to him and she said, verse 25, Lord, help me. Now, if that doesn't touch your heart, nothing will. Amen. This is a cry of desperation. This woman was crying in desperation. Lord, I need help. Now, look at verse 24. He had just told her, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That would have been enough right there to turn a lot of people away. There's a lot of shallow seekers. There's a lot of shallow followers. There's an awful lot of shallow believers. They've believed just a little bit. Most of them just to, enough to keep them out of hell. They're very shallow. They don't want to give the Lord their life. They're not really interested in Him being the Lord of their life. They're very shallow in their relationship with the Lord. If they had had something like that said to them, they would have turned away immediately and said, well, I tried, but it didn't do any good. Let me tell you something. If you try, and you try, and you try, and you try, you will never fail with God. You will never fail with Him. Look at Isaiah chapter number 51. I had planned to go here, but I believe the Holy Spirit would have me do this. Isaiah 51 verse 1. Look carefully at it now. Isaiah 51 1. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look carefully now. Look unto the rock when ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit when ye are digged. Isn't that something? Now look at that. The rock that you were hewn from, and the hole of the pit when ye are digged. You see, there's two things that make you up tonight if you're born again. There's that part that came from the rock, and there's that part that came from the hole. From the pit and from the rock. From the rock to the pit. Now, in the, in the text, it's a reference to Abraham and Israel being brought out from Abraham. And from the whole, there's a reference to Sarah and the birth of Isaac. And therefore, God joined together from two separate places what would make the promise of God of effect. He can do that. But it's the point is that God has brought you into this house tonight with two distinct natures. Learn to understand them. Learn to identify the flesh. Learn to identify a fleshly mind and learn what it takes to overcome that because this is what's going on here. You see, here's a woman that comes to him. And little did the disciples understand. The Lord Jesus knew. The disciples did not understand that he was about to take that woman into a place she'd never been before, take her deep into a place that she'd never been before. Do you remember when Pontius Pilate came before, the, the, the Lord came before Pontius Pilate? And Pilate, Pilate began to question him. What did the Lord Jesus say back to Pilate? He said, do you ask this of yourself or of someone else? Did he not? I'm paraphrasing. I can't remember exactly the terminology verbatim. Remember, that's what he asked him. He said, do you want to know this or you're just doing your job? Or you're going to answer to someone later and write a report out. Which one is it? Do you want to know it? Do you want to know it? <laughs> Quit hiding behind all the garbage you've made up. Do you really want to know? Do you want to know there's a living God who's all powerful? The Syrophoenician woman learns more right here than any of these disciples knew until later. She got ahead of them all. Yes, yeah, she did. She got way ahead of them. Even though they had been out casting devils out, even though they had been out ministering the Word of God, none of them understood the path this woman was about to go down. This woman went down a path that none of them had been down yet. And the amazing thing is that God Almighty doesn't give you cheap stuff and easy stuff because that doesn't help you. That hurts you. A cheap thrill and a cheap feel, that's not going to do you any good. But when it becomes real, and when it gets down into the very heart throb of your soul, you won't forget it. Do you think they ever forgot this? The disciples probably 
for, if it'd be me, I know I'd forget some of the things that happened in his ministry. I couldn't remember every miracle he performed, every demon he cast out, everybody he healed. Could you do that? You'd never forget him walking on water. You wouldn't forget that, would you? But I don't think a one of them ever forgot this Syrophoenician woman and what happened. She cried. She cried out to him and said, Lord, help me. Now, 